If there's one psychologist most people who haven't studied psychology can name, it's going to be Sigmund Freud. The reason for this is likely the incredibly unusual and often sexual theories that form Freud's approach to psychology called psychodynamics. These ideas, while no longer accepted as properly scientific by the vast majority of psychologists, were incredibly influential in the development of later theories and approaches, especially Freud's focus on early childhood experience and the role of an unconscious mind. Freud also developed his ideas into a very popular form of counselling called psychotherapy. The PsychBoost app now has three features, flashcards, multiple choice quizzes, and see if you can work out the key term from its definition with the key term tester. Try Paper 1 for free right now. And Patreon supporters can watch PsychBoost videos ad-free, learn from over 17 hours of exclusive exam tutorial videos, and access hundreds of digital and printable resources, including mind maps, quiz sheets, worksheets, teaching slides, and more. The psychodynamic approach and the role of the unconscious. When we reflect on our mind, we're aware of having thoughts, creating ideas, making decisions, and feeling emotions. Because we're aware of these mental events, we say they happen in the conscious mind. One of Freud's major contributions to psychology was to claim that there's more going on in our mind than what we're consciously aware of. He suggested most of our thoughts happen below the level of consciousness, in the unconscious. Psychodynamics was created by Freud, and we could define it as the study of the unconscious mind and the unconscious mental drives that develop in childhood, their interactions, and how unconscious forces influence behaviour, personality, and mental states. That definition should make a little more sense as we progress through the video. But first, let's make sure we understand the unconscious. According to Freud, the mind, or the psyche, is made up of three parts. The conscious mind, the pre-conscious, and the unconscious. The conscious mind is anything you're aware of. If you can talk about something, you're conscious of it. So this includes your ideas, your decisions, and your emotions. Just below the level of consciousness, there's the pre-conscious. This part of the psyche contains thoughts and memories that we're not currently consciously aware of but we can bring these thoughts into conscious awareness. So, as an example, you likely were not thinking about the capital of France. But now I've said the capital of France, you're now conscious of Paris. Freud claimed the largest part of the mind is unconscious. The thoughts and memories in this part of the mind are not accessible to awareness, but they do influence our conscious feelings and behaviours. The conscious mind contains desires, impulses and repressed memories. So, if the thoughts in this part of the mind are completely inaccessible to conscious introspection, you may be thinking, if we can't access the unconscious, what's the point of it? What's its role? Well, according to Freud, the activity of the unconscious mind drives our conscious behaviour and shapes our personality. This is called psychic determinism. The unconscious shaping of behaviour is due to trying to resolve a conflict between different aspects of personality, as well as how the individual experiences early life stages that Freud called psychosexual stages. Problems in these stages can lead to becoming stuck at that stage, fixation, and ultimately expressing certain negative personality traits. Freud also suggested that the unconscious has a role in protecting the conscious mind from potentially harmful thoughts. These could be traumatic memories, fears, and intense desires. By protecting the conscious mind, this reduces anxiety. The unconsciousness achieves this by using defense mechanisms. Three we need to know about are repression, denial, and displacement. The structure of personality. According to psychodynamics, the adult personality is tripartite, meaning it's constructed of three parts, the id, the ego, and the superego. But for an infant, from birth to around 18 months, there's only an id. The id is a selfish part of the mind, demanding that its own needs and desires are satisfied. For this reason, the id is also known as a pleasure principle, and the id will always be part of the unconscious mind, always looking for pleasure. This is also known as hedonism. At around 18 months, the second, mainly conscious part of personality starts to form, the ego. Also called the reality principle, it's able to use rational thinking to control the demands of the id, and ultimately act as a mediator between the id and the third part. When a child is around three years old, the third part of personality starts to form. This part is mainly unconscious and is called the superego. It forms as a child becomes aware of the values of their parents and society. For this reason, the superego is also known as the morality principle. The superego modifies behaviour by causing feelings of guilt when the individual's actions, 
don't match the superego's strict rules. As you can imagine, there are often conflicts between these aspects of personality, and it's the ego's constant role to attempt to find a balance between the demands for pleasure from the it, with the need to follow the superego's excessive rules. These different parts of personality form the way they do because of the experiences the individual has as they develop an early childhood. To explain what I mean, Freud explains criminal behaviour as being due to the superego, either being too weak compared to the id, or deviant, the superego learnt the values of the parents, but the parents were criminal, so had criminal values, or the superego being too strong, with the criminal committing crime to justify the extreme guilt coming from the superego. We'll come back to this example in the evaluations, and in forensic psychology if you take that option. I imagine all of these terms are starting to feel a little complex. But to see how they fit together, we can look at the iceberg metaphor. This wasn't made by Freud, but it combines Freud's distinction between the conscious, preconscious, and unconscious minds with his structure of personality. I do think, if nothing else, this metaphor makes an important point. When we look at icebergs, we only ever see a small amount visible over the waves. Under the waves, the vast majority of the iceberg is hidden from us. And the iceberg's movement in the ocean isn't due to the small amount that's visible, but the mass of ice under the surface. Freud argues that we're only aware of a small fraction of our thoughts, and the large mass of thoughts hidden away from us in our unconscious is really the driving force behind our behaviour. Psychosexual stages. Okay, this next bit is going to be weird. Even weirder than what I've already said. Freud's theories often have the effect of making us feel uncomfortable, and I think Freud would say that kind of demonstrates his point. Freud argues that as children develop biologically, they must pass through five psychosexual stages, and how they experience these stages will influence their unconscious minds as adults. At each stage, the child will experience an unconscious conflict. This conflict must be resolved. If the child is unable to resolve a stage, they become fixated, and this will alter their personality and can even result in mental disorders called neuroses. You'll notice these stages are linked to body parts. This is because Freud suggests a sexual drive called libido moves around the body and pleasure comes from that part of the body. Keep in mind we need to recall these psychosexual stages in order. So at zero to one years, the child passes through the first stage, the oral stage. The baby receives pleasure from their mouth during breastfeeding. The conflict happens in this stage during weaning, the ending of breastfeeding. It's at this stage that the infant learns it doesn't control the environment and develops delayed gratification. Fixation at this stage results in an immature personality. Between one and three years old is the second stage, the anal stage. In this stage, the child is being potty trained and gets pleasure from holding onto and expelling feces. This is the point where the most famous fixation can happen, anal retentive. This happens if the parents are too strict when punishing mistakes during potty training. Someone who is anal retentive is overly organized and fussy. Next, Freud suggests between three to five, the child enters the phallic stage. The focus of pleasure is now on the genitals. Freud argues it's in this stage that boys experience the Oedipus complex. They feel a strong attraction to their mother and a sense that the father is a competitor for their mother's love. This results in castration anxiety, a fear that the father will find out and remove the boy's genitals. In order to pass through the Oedipus complex, the boy needs to realise he can't compete with his father. So instead, the boy identifies with the father imitating his behaviour, and so develops a male gender identity. Another psychoanalyst, Jung, argues girls experience an electrocomplex, closeness to their father and a dislike of their mother. Freud rejected this idea, instead arguing for both boys and girls the primary object of desire is their mother. Freud did suggest it's in the phallic stage that girls experience penis envy. Girls realise they don't have a penis, they assume they used to have one and it's been removed. Initially, they blame their mother for its loss. However, the desire for a penis is eventually replaced by the desire for a baby, and it's through this process that they identify with their mother and take on a feminine gender identity. That was a little complex, and I do try to make psychology as simple as possible. And honestly, in the real exam, you'll likely be fine talking about the Oedipus and Electra complex in far less detail, but I didn't want to oversimplify this to the point of being wrong. Freudian psychodynamics is complex, but really interesting. And while I'm going to stick to what's going to be credit worthy on the A-level, if you want to explore the ideas of Freud a little further, I really recommend a short series of videos developed by the Freud Museum. They are a fantastic introduction. 
In particular, you might want to watch part three on the Oedipus Complex. And if you're ever in London, or if you plan a school trip, I really recommend a visit to the Freud Museum. In the fourth latency stage, between 6 and 12, Freud suggests that sexual energy is dispersed across the body, and in previous conflicts, desires and memories from early childhood are repressed into the unconscious. In the final genital stage, from around 12 years, this is the point of puberty, and sexual desire is now conscious and in the final adult form. Defense Mechanisms As we've already mentioned, the ego's role is to resolve conflicts between the id and the superego. Defense mechanisms are strategies involving the unconscious mind that the ego can use to manage unresolvable conflicts. The use of defense mechanisms reduces the anxiety felt by the conflict between the id and superego. There are a wide range of defense mechanisms, but here we'll describe three. Denial, displacement, and repression. Denial is when the individual refuses to accept the reality of the situation they're in. An example could be a girlfriend refusing to accept a relationship is over, and is still sending romantic texts to her ex. Displacement is when a strong emotion is moved from the source of that emotion and placed onto a substitute target. Generally, this is a weaker target. An example would be a worker whose boss shouts at them at work. The anger they feel towards their boss can't be expressed to the boss, so it's displaced to a weaker target. So perhaps they go home and shout at their wife. The wife then displaces her anger onto her children. Repression is when an unpleasant memory or painful emotion is placed into the unconscious mind and is no longer accessible to the conscious mind. An example could be someone who is bullied at school being unable to recall memories of being bullied. Evaluating the psychodynamic approach As I've been explaining Freudian theory, you've likely been amazed that Freud's pretty weird ideas are still taught on a modern scientific psychology course. And in reality, the vast majority of practicing psychologists reject the vast majority of psychodynamic concepts, or, in reality, have taken the best ones and reframed them into more scientific language. On that point, there are reasons to teach Freud. From a historical perspective, he's been profoundly influential on later, more scientific psychological theories. Freud's focus on early childhood experience and the long-lasting effects trauma can have on adult life was very unusual in his time. But later researchers like Bowlby used Freudian concepts to develop attachment theories. Freud was also one of the first to develop a somewhat scientific concept of the unconscious mind. And this idea is still with us. For example, cognitive theorists fully accept that there are processes below the level of awareness that influence perception, memory formation, and language. And while many of Freud's ideas seem strange, they do have an intuitive appeal. Often little boys will seem to have a stronger attachment to their mothers than their fathers. People will refer to early trauma, especially in a family context, to explain adult anxieties. People can identify examples of defense mechanisms, so denial, displacement and repression, in people around them. And most people would admit to having desires and anxieties they can't consciously explain. This means some of Freud's ideas have what is called base validity. Psychodynamics has a practical application, Psychoanalysis is based on Freudian ideas and is still a very common form of talking therapy. A meta-analysis of 27 studies, including over 5,000 participants by Dumat, concluded the data supports the effectiveness of long-term psychoanalytic therapy. As many individuals claim to have been successfully treated, this suggests that the underlying ideas have some validity. Despite these strengths, our main criticism of Freud are due to his ideas lacking scientific credibility. Many of his ideas were developed and supported through case study and interpreting his clients' memories, introspections, and dreams. A famous case study of Little Hands is used to support the psychosexual stages of development. However, Little Hands' parents were fans of Freud's work and likely recorded events and conversations that would support Freud's ideas. And Freud's own interpretations were potentially biased. Scientific research attempts to use more objective measures, such as experimentation. Another point that criticizes the scientific natures of Freud's work is his lack of falsifiability. Falsifiability is the ability to demonstrate a theory is incorrect. But Freud would often define his terms and theories in a way that means we simply can't test them. Remember when I told you that Freud explained criminality as being due to an overdeveloped, underdeveloped, or deviant superego? Almost whatever background a criminal has, Freud would claim his theory predicted their criminality. 
I want to thank everyone over on Patreon for supporting the channel. Because of you, I've been able to teach part-time, meaning I can make Psych Boost on YouTube for everyone. And a special thank you to Azzy Taylor for supporting at the developer level. I do have extra resources that are exclusive to my patrons, so if you decide to sign up, you can grab those over my website. And these include over 100 exam question tutorial videos, of course including questions on the Approaches unit. I hope this was helpful and I'll see you in the next Psych Boost video.